these have been shown to have any significant difference in outcome? Studies vary. So you'll have several studies that show improved outcomes, and you'll have just as many showing no difference. Uh, GI lavage. Uh, we're unlikely to use it. Uh, there's more for our seniors who are graduating, wherever you go. But definitely won't be using it here. Um, I've never even seen the equipment we need to use it here. Um, essentially, you're putting a huge OG zoom down and trying to uh, lavage out any whole pills, uh, pill fragments, or any sludge from recently uh, degraded uh, pills. Uh, our typical OG tubes in CCC, you guys know, right? Like 14, 16, 18 French. But for a GI lavage, you need massive ODs with like 34, 36 French, which I haven't seen here. Just to put it into perspective, like those are like chest tube sizes. Uh, so let's talk about charcoal. Um, is everyone familiar with the mechanism? So yeah, we know it binds to stuff and limits absorption. Um, but it can also work with things that are uh, tox-related uh, things that are given IV. And it's been well documented because it can actually extract toxins out from the serum, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. That's how I got this nickname of um, gut dialysis. Uh, the mechanism is related to its surface area, which is why we dose it in uh, 10 to 1 ratio of charcoal to the dr uh, ingested drug, which is fairly easy when you have an ingestion that's in micrograms like digoxin, but when you have something ingested, in milligrams, like uh, this patient that took glucuronium. Um, later on, we found out she had 150 milligram tablets at home. So 150 milligram. Who knows how many she ingested? Let's say 10 tablets. So that's 1,500 milligrams. And if we're going to give a 10 to 1 ratio of charcoal, it's 15,000 milligrams, right? That's 15 grams, which is a massive amount of charcoal to give anyone. Questionable how much it actually helps anyone. Um, there's been tons of studies that contradict each other. Uh, but the risk to giving it is fairly low. You're almost guaranteed to make someone nauseous and vomit, which may actually help in getting the toxin up. Um, there are case reports of aspiration uh, causing this chemical like pneumonitis, uh, charcoal empyema, or an ARDS like picture. And there's also a few case reports of having a SBO. Um, thought to be due from a massive charcoal, which is why it's not recommended. It's contraindicated in anyone that doesn't have any vowel sounds. The American Association of Clinical Toxicologists and European Association of Poison Centers and Clinical Toxicologists have joint statements uh, saying that it should not be routinely administered to everyone, uh, but if you are going to give it, it should be within an hour of the ingested agent. Um, if you are going to give multi-dose charcoal, it should only be reserved for specific ingestions, and these are our long-acting preparations. Uh, so this patient who ingested uh, the long-acting preparation of bucrobion technically fits this category. It's important to know that sometimes charcoal is combined with a cathartic, specifically sorbitol, to increase uh, expulsion of the toxin. If the charcoal is combined with Sorbitol or cathartic, you should not give uh, multiple doses of it. Um, it's been associated with huge shifts in electrolytes and uh, significant uh, volume depletion. Our poison control center actually did a, their own study looking at all the hospitals in their catch area, and there's a surprising number, I think it was 16% of all the hospitals, who only had this combined preparation. And over a book, 49% of the cases where they actually recommended multi-dose activated charcoal, uh, the providers gave the wrong preparation because they didn't know, or that was the only one their hospital had. So it's good to be aware of. Um, so charcoal, again, evidence doesn't show huge benefit, but I think it's possible to, for our patient being that there's not much harm, uh, as long as she's protecting her airway, which she now intubated. This is an aside. If you drink charcoal and then you go try to activate, you're going to see a lot of black and it's going to make it So I, I didn't go into some of the um, indications or contraindications, but if someone you think it will need uh, an
endoscopy, for example, you know, everything would be stained black. So that's probably not the best thing to get charcoal to. Uh, does everyone know how to do whole bowel irrigation? Does anyone know? Does one person know? All right, Sally, how do you do it? So you're running go lightly through an OG tube, uh, anywhere one to two liters per hour. And imagine that, imagine how messy that's gonna get. So mostly they actually get rectal tubes, um, or the nurse will kill you. Uh, and the duration of whole aggregation is until the rectal effluent runs clear. I would not be upset if someone found a word to replace rectal effluent. <laughs> Um, this patient had 24 hours of whole bowel irrigation, which is pretty long, um, which is usually which is very unusual. It usually doesn't last for more than a couple hours before everything starts to run clear. Uh, eliminates, uh, increases the elimination of the drug um, by just increasing GI transit time. Again, not much benefit showing that it works. But in uh, ingestions where you have these long acting preparations, um, there's lots of case reports that show patients have had good outcomes. If you are going to give a patient charcoal, um, there is evidence showing that whole bowel irrigation decreases the efficacy of it. So if you, by just being absorbed to the charcoal itself, and possibly displacing some toxins. So if you are going to give uh, charcoal, you would do it before irrigation. And I'm not sure how long should we after. I'll guesstimate maybe an hour before you start to irrigate. Um, once everything runs clear and you stop the irrigation, you actually redose and you give a second dose of charcoal. Uh, joint tox statements, again, should not be routinely used, but anything where a sustained prep was ingested um, should be considered. And there are toxins that aren't don't bind well to the charcoal, right? So our metals which are iron, zinc, uh, lead, don't bind, or lithium, don't bind to charcoal. Uh, any strong alkali or acids, don't bind to charcoal. Um, so again, in these cases, at least theoretical, no uh, randomized trials looking at these specific agents, but in theory, uh, whole bowel irrigation could be useful, or in our notorious body packers that show up on every in service. Uh, so, as far as our purposes for GID contamination, I think these are probably our best two options, charcoal and whole bowel irrigation, depending on the agent that was ingested. If it wasn't something that's very long acting, then it probably wouldn't be whole bowel irrigation. Any questions on this? Um, so our other therapies we can do, typically, at least ideally should be toxin or mechanism specific. Um, and then we'll just run through these really quickly. Um, these are our ingested agents. Uh, Propion, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitor, to a lesser extent serotonin, but at high doses we said can block sodium channels. Um, these are our side effects by far, most common is seizures. Even at therapeutic dosing, um, there is an increased risk of seizures. These are just treated judiciously with benzos, and bars a second line agent. Uh, has anyone ever given someone intralipid? <coughs> Intralipid is a brand, but uh, lipid emulsion. And we'll talk about that specifically in this setting as well. Um, furosemide, we know a lot. Sodium, potassium, chloride, re uh, reabsorption in the ascending loop of the nephron. Uh, everyone's familiar with the side effects. Nothing really specific to do other than just really good supportive care. Rehydrating and replacing electrolytes. Uh, for warfarin, we all know the mechanism. Side effects can be nothing or catastrophic. Um, again, just really good supportive care, and depending on the INR, you can give vitamin K, um, PCC, or FFP for any active <coughs> In our patient that has this, that has pretty bad cardiac function, FFP probably wouldn't be the better choice, um, and transfusion needed. Okay, so who knows what lipid emulsion is? Is this a 
essentially this dense combination of triglycerides, phospholipids, um, initially thought just to help with uh, removal of uh, toxins that are lipophilic. The best data we have is in um, uh, Pivacaine for local anesthetic toxicity, and actually in Verapamil. So the mechanism isn't really clear. There's this lipid sink theory where it removes toxins that are lipophilic from their binding sites and just deposes them in like adipose tissue. It's also thought that it actually enhances uh, cardiac myocyte metabolism by giving it plenty of free fatty acid substrates. Um, there's lots of case reports that actually show improvement, only about 15 or so percent were associated with uh, no difference. About six of these case reports were in Bupropion specifically, and five of them showed improved outcomes. <laughs> There's only one that showed no difference. Um, and surprisingly, it was shown to have an effect in both lipid soluble and water soluble uh, ingestions. But there haven't been any randomized trials um, looking at lipid emulsion. It's prim primarily because it's really hard to study. Um, lots of confounders. Um, it's usually given um, in this systematic review after at least two to three other therapeutic agents were given. It's kind of a last-ditch effort. Um, possible, likely lots of uh, um, potential for bias, um, being that it's the last medication given. So when there is a good outcome, there's that temporal relationship where, oh, we gave lipid emulsion and the patient got better. Um, so you tend to maybe associate these better outcomes with lipid emulsion when it could have been with any of the other agents given. Um, there's not really any adverse effects. There is case reports of I think maybe one or two of the pancreatitis, um, but no real downside in giving it. Other than it may, there's been a couple cases where it skewed lab results due to the extreme lipemia, um, but it's not very common. But currently it's not recommended for anything other than uh, local uh, anesthetic toxicity, but um, the same joint toxicization say it can be given in the cardiac arrest um, due to a suspected uh, toxic gesture. Um, this case report, um, which I thought was pretty interesting, uh, from a weight patient that had ing patient ingested bupropion and lamotrigine, um, was found to be cardiac arrest. ACL is performed for 70 minutes with no improvement, given lipid emulsion and receiving ROS within a minute. Uh, they trended the bupropion levels, I didn't know you could send a level, um, prior to and after getting lipid emulsion with triglyceride levels, and they both increased, uh, they had a parallel increase in both, and then trended downwards, um, which kind of goes with the whole lipid sink theory. Uh, so this was pretty much attributed, this outcome was pretty much attributed to the lipid emulsion. And this patient actually had complete cardiac recovery and was discharged with very minimal uh, neurologic effects. I think it was just maybe mild hand tremors. Um, all right, so we kind of talked about how to approach tox suggestions, um, how to approach GI decontamination. Um, most importantly, just want to know when to use it and how to do it and uh, management. When all else fails, give intralipid. Um, ECMO is a possibility, but it's not for us. Um, specifically because if you can buy a patient enough time for the toxin to be excreted or metabolized, technically you can have a great recovery. Um, our local <coughs> ECMO center is MIMO, um, so you can call MIMO and consult them for ECMO, and they can actually come in, is Casey here? She lectured on this last week. Actually, come and um, put in the access and could get started if they think it's a candidate. Um, this is just busy stuff. Any questions about the case? In general, I uh, just have one comment actually. So, and as young, really what appropriately did a good job presenting that supportive care is often the only thing and the first thing we should do for these patients. So, I just want to urge you guys to. Even in the cardiomyopathy CHF patient, don't be afraid of fluids. It's a very sick <coughs> patient who has a problem that's not CHF. Those patients seem like they were given some fluids, but maybe there's a fear of giving me more. And I'm not sure if it would change anything, but just think about it that way. And the other thing, when you're thinking about cardiomyopathy,
cardiac uh, induction issues. Think about potassium, but also remember the magnesium. Her she was 1.6, and it may not have come up as a abnormal, but ideally you'd like to get these guys into the level two. And especially if you are correcting potassium, you should be correcting mag uh, with that as well. Yes, <coughs> well, as well as calcium. So you know, you want to think of any ingested yeah. agent that could be um, contributing to this, uh, but also any metabolic um, derangement. So as Dr. Rose mentioned, um, hypomag, hypocalcemia, um, repleting all these can help maybe shorten that QT syndrome, the QTC. Sometimes it's just keeping their body going until the toxin is gone, so support them if you read that. So we're a couple comments on the poison control center. For one, they're really smart. They're some of the smart people I've ever met. So call them because they may know stuff that you don't know, the newest things, whatever's going on. The second thing is call them for everything because they get money from the government based on how many calls they get. Even if it's a BS little injection and you know what to do, you should still call them because they get money from the national government for their cases. Mark Sue's the director there now. He's a grad rock program. We all want to help out. Mark, he's a great guy. But the Voice Control Center is there to serve us and to help us. The more fun they get, the better. So really try and call them in as many cases as you can. And we'll uh, so we, we have the pharmacy as a protocol for looking for that down saying so you could call and they'll help you. Uh, kind of I used it. Uh, one of the pharmacists came up and helped the nurses administer it. So uh, they will be able to help. What did you use it for? Uh, I think it was a suspected TCA. Also, I don't know, did anybody else read the thing that came out about a competitive sodium channel blockade for TCA, pure TCA overdose? For someone that was just like, they were throwing the kitchen sink and they gave lidocaine yeah. um, 100 milligrams over half an hour and it caused a competitive sodium channel blockade and the patient actually, they were widening the QRS sort of narrowed and they avoided it. Yeah, the poison control talks about that a lot when you go there. It's a, it's a less potent uh, sodium channel blocker, but it's, it, uh, it acts uh, stronger than TCA. So yeah. It's not. Yeah, I've heard you talk to like, the one big thing I learned. Uh, in, like TCA blockade, you're giving sodium, it's not working, you're taking more control types, but you're waiting your life, and it's like first choice. Um, and one last uh, point like, regarding our case uh, the second EKG after the sodium bicarb was given, um, it was repeated after about an hour and a half after sodium bicarb. So it acts pretty quickly if you're looking for the QRS narrowing effect. Um, ideally, you treat it like uh, adenosine, how we have the EKG machine connected, we have it running. You don't need the paper running, it's just a waste. But you want to repeat the EKG immediately after giving the sodium uh, bicarb. Roughly, the effects last anywhere, maybe like five to 10 minutes at most. Um, so I would use, I usually have the EKG machine on, I give the bicarb, and I repeat it after about a 